And we can move on to the next paper of the session, who is going to be introduced, presented by Lara Coulier from the ECB, and asks a very interesting question. Are low interest rates firing back interest rate risk in the banking book and bank lending in a rising interest rate environment? Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lara, and today I will present joint work with Cosimo Pancaro and Alessio Regeza, both from the European Central Bank. So I also have this disclaimer that the views expressed in this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the ECB. So as said, my, our paper is titled Are Low Interest Rates Firing Back? Interest Rate Risk in the Banking Book and Bank Lending in a Rising Interest Rate Environment. <laughs> Okay, what is the focus of our paper? So we know that the low for long interest rate environment has altered the bank's balance sheets. We will show descriptively that banks have built up the duration of their asset side during this period. However, we will also show that interest rate risk only materialized when the ECB started to increase interest, rate, interest rates unexpectedly fast. We look at the implications of this materialization of interest rate risk for bank lending supply, and we find that banks that are more exposed to interest rate risk contract their lending more compared to their peers. And we also find that these banks reshuffle their uh, portfolio uh, towards away from long-term and fixed rate lending, and they do this to reduce their exposure to interest rate risk. Our findings reveal that micro, small and medium-sized enterprises are mostly affected by this contraction in lending by banks with a large exposure to interest rate risk. And we find that affected firms cannot substitute the contraction in lending by borrowing more from uh, banks with a lower exposure to interest rate risk. So our paper is related to the uh, literature on bank maturity transformation and monetary policy. For example, uh, the paper by Drechsel et al. from 2017, which has also been discussed uh, during the previous presentation. And what this paper finds is that when there's a monetary policy tightening, this uh, triggers an outflow of deposits. And this outflow of deposits also impacts the lending side. And this is an argument, a similar argument, that we will use in the paper as well. Our paper is also related to uh, the literature on the bank lending channel, where people study which bank characteristics weaken or amplify the transmission of monetary policy to bank lending. However, to our knowledge, there are only uh, two empirical uh, papers that look at the effect of interest rate risk on the transmission of monetary policy to lending. So the first paper is a paper using bank level data from Switzerland, and this paper focuses on the duration gap. I will explain this concept um, in more detail later, but uh, what it captures is it captures the maturity mismatch of the entire uh, maturity structure of a bank's balance sheet. And this paper finds that banks with a larger duration gap reduce lending more when interest rates increase to remain in compliance with their capital requirements. The second paper is a paper using uh, data from the US, both at bank and at bank firm level data. And, uh, this paper uses the income gap, uh, which captures the maturity mismatch only up to one year, so more like a short-term uh, measure of interest rate risk. And this paper finds that banks with a larger uh, income gap reduce lending less when interest rates increase because of an increased uh, net interest income. Now, you may wonder why there's only two papers uh, that investigate this topic, given that it's highly relevant and also topical. Well, this uh, relates to um, data constraints. For example, the paper using uh, Swiss data has to use uh, bank level data, cannot control for credit demand effects, for example. While the second paper only looks at the income gap, capturing a, a small part of the maturity mismatch, I cannot capture the whole picture. And this is where our paper comes in. So we make use of two unique and extensive uh, data sets, the first one being AnaCredit, so the European Credit Registry, the Euro Area Credit Registry. And the second one being a supervisory data set that captures the behavioral maturity mismatch across the whole maturity structure of the entire balance sheet. And it includes information on hedging, such that we can control for hedging against interest rate risk. Last but not least, we make use of um, 
these, the combination of these two detailed data sets and the unique uh, economic setting we're in now, so meaning that there was a monetary policy tightening that followed after a very long period of low interest rates to study the effects of um, interest rate risk on bank lending. So first I will show you descriptively what happened with banks' balance sheets during the low interest rate environment. So banks um, build up the duration of their asset side and mostly to, comp to compensate for compressed margins during this period of low interest rates. And also customers were interested in this because they wanted to lock in low rates for a very long time. And this we also show in the chart on the left-hand side where we showed that um, the uh, outstanding volume and the new business volume of loans with a large maturity has been increasing steadily since uh, the global financial crisis. And this has increased the duration of the asset side of the banks. And on the right-hand side, we also show uh, the, this increase in duration for fixed-rate loans. At the same time, on the liability side, there was a large inflow of sticky overnight deposits. Sticky meaning that these deposits typically stayed for a quite a long time on the balance sheet. Banks use um, assumptions based on historical customer behavior to estimate how long these type of deposits stay on the balance sheet. So banks took into account this stickiness and modeled the duration of overnight deposits to be actually even longer than the duration of term and redeemable deposits, as, you can, as we show on the chart on the right hand side. So this large inflow of uh, liabilities with a large duration increased the duration of the liability side of the banks, counterbalancing the increase in the duration of the asset side of the banks, leading to a stable exposure to interest rate risk in the low interest rate environment. But then, in July 2022, the ECB started to increase interest rates. And since that moment, we see that immediately there has been a material shift from overnight towards term and redeemable deposits. Since these, have, these deposits have a shorter duration, this reduced the duration of the bank liability side, leading to a materialization of interest rate risk or net duration risk. And this we also show on this chart. So this chart shows you the average uh, duration gap for euro area banks over time. And you see that between 2019 and the beginning of 2022, this duration gap has remained uh, quite stable over time. However, since July 2022, you see that there was a steep increase in the duration gap. All right, I've now mentioned the term duration gap a few times, but uh, how do we measure this exactly? Uh, so this is where we use the bank level supervisory data that uh, captures information on cash flows for each repricing and maturity bucket of the bank for all uh, instruments on bank's balance sheet. And the duration gap captures the time to receive the cash flows from the asset side minus the time to receive the cash flows from the liability side. When a bank has a positive duration gap, this signals that a bank will lose in terms of economic value of equity when interest rates increase because assets will lose more value than liabilities because of their larger duration. There are two important features of this uh, data set I want to highlight. So first, I mentioned already that uh, the data set contains information on behavioral assumptions that banks use to model the duration of their balance sheets. So for example, they uh, use assumptions to uh, estimate how long uh, deposits, overnight deposits will stay on the balance sheet, but also they estimate how many loan prepayments there they will be. Second, uh, as also mentioned before, we, the data set includes information on derivative positions, such that um, our duration gap is actually net of hedging. Uh, and we can control for the fact that banks also hedge against interest rate risk. Before moving on to our uh, empirical analysis, first we have to answer the question, why should interest rate risk matter for bank lending? And uh, in the paper, we use several arguments for that. The first one is that we know from the literature that banks try to have a stable duration gap over time and that they want to match the duration of their assets and liabilities to lock in long-term profits with stable funding. Therefore, a, a sudden reduction in the duration on the liability side might also trigger a reaction on the asset side. Second, we know that net duration risk um, signals losses in economic value of equity, which entails lower expected profitability and capital accumulation in the medium run. <coughs> 
This is also supported by this paper by uh, English, which shows that the positive impact of an increase in interest rates on bank profitability actually fades out and becomes even negative after one year. And we also show it in the chart on the right that uh, having a larger duration gap has a negative effect on the projected change in net interest income over 12 months. And then finally, supervisors may ask banks with a large exposure to interest rate risk to hold additional capital to cover for interest rate risk. Banks will want to avoid this supervisory scrutiny and keep their interest rate risk contained and deleverage uh, to do that. To answer our research question, we have to face multiple empirical challenges. The first one is that we want to control for credit amount such that we are sure that the effects we capture are purely driven by the supply side. We do this by using firm time or industry location size time fixed effect as a standard in the literature. Next, we also want to control for the interest rate type, so whether a loan is fixed or floating. Because banks with a high duration gap might especially want to reduce their fixed rate lending and maybe even increase their floating rate lending to keep their uh, duration gap or to lower their duration gap. And we do this by additionally interacting these firm time or industry location size time fixed effects with interest rate type fixed effects. And the result of this combination of fixed effects is that we compare uh, lending to the same firm coming from multiple banks with the to the same firm with the same interest rate type coming from multiple banks with a different uh, duration gap. Third, we have to control for the fact that the monetary policy tightening also had a positive impact on bank profits in the short run. And we do this by controlling for the heterogeneous impact of uh, net interest income on lending. And in the next slides, it will become more clear how we uh, specifically do that. And then finally, it can be argued that the tightening in mon monetary policy was not entirely exogenous, that banks expected some kind of tightening to happen. However, the pace and the magnitude of the tightening was not expected. And this we show uh, on the chart here, where we use data uh, from the survey of monetary analysts. And if you look at the yellow line, which shows the expectations on the interest rate part in the month right before the tightening, you see that this part is a lot lower and goes up a lot slower than the red line, which is the actual realized interest rate part. This is uh, our empirical strategy. So we estimate these, um, this regression at the bank firm quarter level, where our dependent variable is the change in lending and our coefficient of interest is this beta, which captures the heterogeneous impact of a change in the policy rate, uh, depending on the level of the duration gap of a bank at time t minus one. We include multiple bank level characteristics that might also have an impact on lending, such as bank size, profitability, the income gap, funding structure, capitalization, liquidity, and non-performing loans. Importantly, we also allow for all these control variables to have a heterogeneous impact uh, of changes in the policy rate. So, and that's, that is this interaction between this X term and the change in the policy rate. And this is how we also uh, control for the fact that some banks might have benefited more from a tightening in monetary policy in terms of profitability and the impact that this has on lending. We use the combination of fixed effects as explained before, and in some specifications, we also include country times time fixed effects. Our time frame goes from 2021 Q1 to 2023 Q2, and we have 73 significant institutions in our sample. And now I can move on to showing you our uh, results, starting with the results for the intensive margin, uh, looking at the effects on lending growth. And the four columns you see here differ in the aspect that in the second and the fourth column, we include uh, the control variables interacted with the change in the policy rate. And in the first two columns, we do not include country times time fixed effects while we do in the third and the fourth column. As you can see from the coefficients in the red box, we find a negative and statistically significant coefficient for our uh, beta, so our coefficient of, in of interest. To put these results into some more perspective, we find that 
when interest rates increase by 100 basis points, a bank with a duration gap at the 75th percentile reduces lending by around 90 basis points more than a bank at the 25th percentile. Similarly, we also find that banks with a higher duration gap have a lower prob probability of issuing a new loan compared to their peers. Together, these results suggest that banks with a higher duration gap deleverage more than their peers when interest rates increase. Second, we want to look at whether there's any portfolio reshuffling coming from these banks with a high duration gap. And the first dimension we look at is uh, loan maturity. So we will compare the effects on short-term lending growth versus long-term lending growth. And as you can see from the coefficients in column five to eight, we find a negative and significant effect for long-term lending growth, meaning that banks with a high duration gap especially reduce their long-term lending. Um, and this is intuitive because this long-term lending is, are the loans driving the high duration gap. So by reducing this lending growth, they will also reduce their duration gap and their exposure to duration risk. On the other hand, we do not find any significant impact on short-term loans. And again, we find also similar results on the probability of issuing a new loan. Um, yeah, before moving on to the next slide, I want to say that the fact that there is a reduction in long-term lending can have important implications for firms, since it exposes firms to more financing risk, which can uh, impair their investment strategies. A second um, dimension of reshuffling we look at is uh, to the interest rate types. So we want to look at whether there's a differential effect on fixed rate versus floating rate uh, loans. To estimate these regressions, we have to remove the interest rate type fixed effects from our uh, regressions, such that we can use a triple interaction uh, with a dummy, which is one when the loan has a floating rate. From the first red box, um, this which shows you the coefficient that captured the effect on fixed rate lending, we find that banks with a high duration gap reduce their, especially reduce their fixed rate lending compared to their peers. For the effect on the floating rate loans, which is shown in the second red box and is uh, evaluated using an F-test, we do not find uh, overall a significant effect. Again, this makes sense. These fixed rate loans are the ones driving the higher duration, so reducing them will also reduce their uh, exposure to duration risk and may help the banks in avoiding supervisory scrutiny. And again, we find similar results on the probability of issuing a new loan. Since we find um, evidence of a lending contraction, we also want to know which type of firms would be more affected by this contraction in lending. And we do this by looking at uh, different firm sizes. So again, we make use of a triple interaction um, where the baseline category represents the results for the large firms. And then we have results for medium-sized, small-sized, and micro-sized firms. From the first line, you can see that um, we do not find that banks with a larger duration gap significantly reduce their lending towards large firms. However, the results become significant and um, more relevant also in terms of significance and magnitude for mostly the small and micro-sized firms. So again, to put these coefficients into a bit of perspective, we find that when interest rates increase by 100 basis points, a bank with a duration gap at the 75th percentile reduces lending by 90 to 97 basis points more to small firms compared to large firms, while this is between 40 to 56 basis points for micro and medium-sized firms. This could have important implications for um, the real economy, for financial stability, since um, it might be harder, more difficult for, especially for small and micro-sized firms, to get access to alternative funding. Uh, they do not have access to markets-based funding like the large firms do, and are often also um, faced with a, a larger lending discretion when trying to get credits from the banks. Of course, um, we find this reduction for high duration gap banks, uh, contraction in credit. There would be no problem if the affected firms can substitute by borrowing more from other banks, for example, the banks with a lower exposure to interest rate risk with a lower duration gap. So we want to also empirically uh, test whether there's an effect in the aggregate for the highly exposed firms. <laughs> 
So to do this, we move on to a firm quarter level analysis where we estimate whether the change in the monetary policy rate had a differential effect for highly exposed firms compared to other firms. And here we define highly exposed firms as um, firms that um, borrow for more than 50% uh, from high duration gap banks. And here high duration gap banks are uh, defined as banks in the top quartile of the distribution in the first quarter of our sample. And as you can see, we find that the coefficient of interest is negative and statistically significant. Um, meaning that firms that are highly exposed to banks with a high duration gap exhibit around 75 basis points lower bor borrowing compared to other firms. And meaning that firms cannot fully substitute the contraction in borrowing coming from uh, banks with a high duration gap. Our results are robust uh, to multiple robustness checks, and for the sake of time, I will only highlight a few of them. So if you could please go to the first results, yes. So first thing we do is that um, we include single bank firm relationships into our uh, sample. Uh, why? Because as you can see from the first, from the chart there, these relationships can be quite important for um, multiple countries in the Euro area. And uh, the results are shown in the first four columns uh, of this table. And as you can see, uh, our coefficient of interest is still negative and statistically significant. A second thing that we do is that we only, so we restrict the sample to only include single bank firm relationships. We do this to limit um, any self-selection that there might still be for uh, firms that uh, have multiple bank relationships, since they could choose to uh, borrow less from banks with a higher duration gap. But also, when only focusing on this sample, we still find a negative and statistically significant results. So if you could go back to the slide and show the next results. Thank you. Um, so uh, something else that we do is we use a predetermined duration gap to perform our regressions uh, to limit reverse causality issues, and we have two approaches of doing that. So one would be um, rather simple, where we fix the level of the duration gap at a level uh, before the tightening, and we see what the, what the regressions tell us. And in the third and the fourth column, you can see that, again, our baseline results are confirmed. Then uh, another approach we take is that we use, uh, we collapse the data in the pre and post uh, event setting. Meaning that we look at the change in lending pre and post the monetary policy tightening and we keep all the independent variables at the level before the tightening. And also in this case our results are confirmed. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to highlight here was, um, the, so uh, another robustness check we do is that uh, we control for the deposit base of a bank. Why? So we argue in the beginning of the paper that the materialization of interest rate risk was related to the shift from overnight towards term and redeemable deposits. This, the magnitude of the shift might be related to the deposit base of a bank. Uh, for example, if a bank has more deposits to uh, firms than to households. Firms are typically more eager to move their deposits around and to find more remunerating uh, alternatives. The shift is uh, larger. So that's what we also witness in the data, where we see that the shift for firms, so the yellow lines, was more pronounced than the shift for households, the, the blue lines. So we want to control also for this aspect in our regressions, and we include the share of overnight deposits to households in the regressions, and as the other control variables, we also interact this with the change in the policy rate. But even when doing that, we find a negative and statistically significant effect for our coefficient of interest, meaning that banks with a higher duration gap con contract lending more when interest rates increase. You can go back, thank you. Okay, so. I won't talk about all the other robustness checks. But then finally, let me conclude. So we find that banks with a larger duration gap, the leverage and reduce especially their long-term and fixed rate lending more compared to their peers when interest rates increase. And they do this to reduce their duration gap and to avoid supervisory scrutiny.
We find evidence that small firms are mostly affected by this deleveraging, and we find that affected firms cannot fully substitute the contraction in lending. Our findings have important policy implications. First, we find that the transmission of monetary policy to bank lending is heterogeneous, uh, depending on the level of the duration gap of a bank. And second, we find evidence for a contraction in lending, especially long-term lending, which could exacerbate the economic downturn with most pronounced effects uh, for micro, small and medium-sized firms. So that was it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lara. Um, the discussion will be given by uh, David Martinez Miera from the Universidad Carlos Terciero. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, everyone, for being here, and especially Philip, Diana, Bjorn, everyone that has organized this, for allowing me to read such an inter interesting paper that I will be able to remember. I normally don't remember papers. This one, I'm sure. It has a very straight point. And let me just go here. Basically, do, does bank duration gap affect lending responses to rate increases? Yes, that's it. That's my discussion. So if you have to remember, that's it. It's very clear, super robust, throw out whatever you want, that is happening. So I guess that part of the CHAMP network already has a result. There you have it. Now, all my discussion, if anything, is that little, but why? Could we learn a little bit more of why this is happening? It is happening, I have no doubt about it. Maybe we can learn a little bit more of why it's happening, just in case there's CHAMP 2 or something like that. OK? Good. Well, the, something if you want to take in mind here is that these are big banks. OK? We're talking here about big banks. Just in case someone thinks about, you know, is this relevant or not, probably yes. I really don't care. These are the most important banks in Europe. But anyway, those are the big banks. OK? And again, the main evidence is the main evidence. Duration matters for transmission of monetary policy, or at least rate hikes to lending. Now, the paper is relevant, timely, yes. There's something that even gets someone like me, that I'm more, I think of myself, more of an applied theorist, excited. The data is awesome, so probably I'm going to try to poke her to tell us a bit more about the data, or even poke some of you that know the data over dinner, because there's a couple of things that are very interesting. You have all balance sheet items, you have some other interesting things happening. I'm going to talk about them later. And yeah, basically what I'm going to say, can I, can I learn more about why is this happening? OK, just in case you just arrived here from some outer planet or something, basically monetary policy is back on tracks, low for long, has, has ended. And maybe the consequences of low for long are here. That's something that the paper hints at. I'm going to talk about later. I don't really think the paper is about that. But anyway, I'll come back to that. Now, just a brief reminder. I had to go check some of my class notes on duration. A brief reminder. Yeah, we all remind you, know, if the rates go up, this can affect the value of the assets or the liabilities down. That was OK. What exactly is duration? Well, basically, it's a weighted average of the cash flows. That's not so relevant for today. But what's relevant for today, or you already remember, but I didn't remember so much, is that duration is actually happening. It's actually capturing how much the value of your asset is going to fall when the rate goes up. OK? So if the duration is high, if the interest rates, rates go up, the value of that asset is going to go down a lot. OK? So basically, what do the authors do? They basically go, oh, let's put all the assets and liabilities together. That's where the gap is coming from. And let's subtract the, the liability part from the asset part. OK, you have the asset duration. You subtract from the liability duration. The whole bank, this is awesome. They have all this off balance sheet. That was something that I always wanted to know about. And you, they put it in. And then you have a measure of how exposed is the bank's value, at least with this measure, to rate hikes. Great. That's what they're doing. Now, does this matter? It looks like it does. Basically, what you're seeing here is the last two, three years. Something that caught my eye, and it's not about the paper, but this is one of the first questions I'm going to ask there to see if someone grabs. Look at the, the yellow line is actually the hedging part, OK? And the blue line, and the blue, sorry, line, the, the, the blue part is basically the on balance sheet items. That's sort of what I understand. It's the off balance sheet to on balance sheet. And what you see is that the on-balance sheet items are changing its duration, but not the off-balance sheet. OK, that's not about what this paper is about, but maybe there's some trend there that might be relevant to understand. I'm, I'm somehow thinking that maybe hedging is more related to off-balance sheet. It was never clearly stated in the paper. I'm just making it up, OK? So maybe there's something there that might be, might be valuable. valuable. Anyway, 
this is the paper for you, or for me at least. What's the paper? Basically, what we see is that when the policy rate goes up, when you use the, when you use the cross section dispersion of banks, you see that those that I'm going to use Titan, okay? This is a diff in diff, so it's relative everything, but let me use Titan. Titan lending more are the ones that have a higher duration gap, okay? That were more exposed to a decrease in their value because of this rate hike, okay? This happens in the total amount of loans, this happens on new loans, so extended intensives, and also. It happens more for high maturity loans, so that this reshuffling that, that Lara was talking about, they cut especially the long-term loans, and if anything, in some of the new loans, which I think was even interesting, they actually increase a bit more the short-term loans. That's actually nice. And this happens more for, sm for small firms, okay? So I think that's also relevant. This is not happening for the big firms. Be worried about the small firms of your country. That's where this is actually, this channel is hitting, okay? Now, Here's some, I'm going to do a very cheap comment here, so sorry for that. So basically, I think we all have this idea that bank finance is not perfectly substitutable. So basically, they find that it is not substitutable. Okay, and something very, I'm sure that she has 75 robustness checks, so sorry for us for 76. Just to include real effects, you know, it's, it's going to come, I bet. So there's nothing new there, but yes, I guess that, that's there. Don't worry, I will have some hopefully valuable comment. So this is probably this. So what is driving the results? So we have the duration gap, okay? And the first thing that struck, strikes me hard is that it's totally unrelated to any bank characteristics, okay? You have the duration gap. It's not related to the total assets, the cash, the ROA, throw whatever you want on it. It looks like it's not correlated. Maybe I got it wrong, but that's already an interesting fact per se, okay? Now, Actually, is it related to the low rates? Because this relates to the low for long kicking in or not. So maybe you could give some simple evidence that actually duration gaps were related to the low for long. Or the longer you are down, the more you get exposed. Because there's a narrative of that. There's some you know, anecdotal evidence. Maybe you can link it. Because then you can link in, I think, nicer the low for long to the kicking in than and something like that. If not, I'm, I'm more skeptical. Now. What would I do? What, what I would do is I would actually decompose the gap. There's different elements of the gap. You have off-balance sheet or non-balance sheet items. Decompose them. You have asset and liability duration. Decompose them. You will see that I'm going to run for two minutes on something that has nothing to do with the paper, that I'm super excited about your paper, and it's definitely not about what you've been talking about, which has to do with the belief structures of people and things like that, okay, or your commentary. But anyway, on the, long story short, I would decompose, see which of the duration is more relevant, because maybe it's that it's coming more from the asset side than from the liability side. You are talking a lot about the liability sort of input, but maybe there's something going, going there on the asset side. What really, I don't really know. I could talk to you later about some ideas, but I think that this is easy to check. Okay? Now, what I would try to separate is basically at least four stories. The most obvious one would be the last one. So I think that's what's happening, but let us go one by one. So part of your narrative is that this is related to the liability, yeah? The household deposits that they basically can run and change, and this changes the duration gap, and this can lead to contraction. But actually, given you say you control for it in one your real business, but when you see if that's significant, you find that household competition is not actually significant for the transmission of monetary policy. So on that side, I would, it may not be that it's so much about the deposits, the household deposits driving all of this. It could be. I'm, not, I'm just saying that that might be one story that you want to dig deeper. Now, they do something very nice that they check for actual capital requirements, okay? But what I'm wondering is, could this be about marketing post capital requirements, okay? Could it be that banks basically have, you know, Ala Bernanke, Kiyotaki Moore, all this type of, of marketing post capital requirements? I have a duration gap. My future equity or my equity value is going down. Then somehow the market saying, hey, you cannot lend so much, okay? Because you abscond or any of these theories. Now, you talk about supervision. Well, why is this happening? Capital, we know it's not an issue there because you control for it, so it's not happening because of that. Maybe it's happening for other issues, like, I don't know, liquidity coverage ratios are getting worse because of this duration gap. Or maybe there's some elements of stress tests that are actually hitting, and this is what's driving the so I don't know, if you could help us there a little bit, 
then this would, would help us. And basically, I think this is as simple as, well, if the marginal income that a bank can make from doing his business goes down, probably the quantity comes down. As simple or as difficult as that. Uh, you know, if, if you can cross some of the dots, then maybe that, that goes us to say that this is the, the ending story. Now, related to this, there's something surprising for me is that basically nearly more than, well, more than 25% of its sample have negative duration gaps, okay? That means that banks are lending short-term and borrowing long-term, okay? I'm gonna repeat this two times more in the next five minutes, so don't worry, okay? Now, why am I saying that? Well, I would actually try to you know, get more of that, decompose the sample into these two types of banks. It could be very different for a bank that is actually doing you know, a positive duration gap, and hence the interest rate hike is actually decreasing its value, than for a bank that has a negative duration gap in which an increase in the rate is actually increasing its value. To, to their credit, you do have a dummy there that tries to, but I think you're controlling for a different story here. What I'm telling here is, do you see the same symmetrical effects on the positive gap guys than on the negative gap guys? Why? Well, basically because I think that predictions I have in my head are different. One should tighten constraints and the other one should loosen. One should lend more, and I know this is undefined, so all of this is relative, but you know, looking there, maybe you could be able to disentangle some stories. Well, here comes my, my comment that is a bit related to your paper and not so much. It has to do with the overnight deposit duration. So I think only this deserves a couple of papers. So let's see if I'm right or not. So basically, overnight deposits have long maturities. I'm sure no one is surprised. I had to read it three or four times. You know, I actually went to Google to check it. Why? Well, basically, what I thought is that the contractual maturity of an overnight deposit is one day, and I think I'm right, okay? The difference comes from this belief structure that I think is very nice that they have. Basically, we are allowing banks, I'm sure for very good reasons, quote unquote, to tell us what, how sticky are their deposits. This is what's changing this idea. So then basically overnight deposits actually have high maturity, not because contract, contractually they have low maturity, no. Contractually they have short, very extremely short maturity. It's just because banks, through their models, say that even the contractual maturity is one day, let me put X, when I don't really know what X is, okay? Now, this is a fundamental effect on the calculation of the of the gap, because remember, the gap was the asset, side, the asset side duration or maturity minus the liability side. So any estimation here is gonna affect fundamentally your results, okay? Now, I would, I would really wanna see what happens in your results if you run the, and I'm gonna call it contractual duration, okay? So is it all of this about banks' behavioral models telling us something on their duration, or is this just, okay, yeah, forget, it's not about that part, it's about more standard parts of the duration, okay? Because again, this will lead us to learn more of what's underlying, okay? Basically, my suggestion is just run it again, put one, uh, one day maturity on those guys, on the, on the overnight deposits, and see what happens, okay? Now, and this is what's not about your paper, I have two minutes, I'm gonna bore you, but let me say it. So. Anyone knows why this is allowed? Anyone knows why we are allowing banks to have overnight deposits that in principle are very flighty to be stated as very sticky? I am not sure this is theoretically sound, okay? Theoretically, if you receive a shock, new pricing, you are gonna react more in all contracts in which you can react, as I'm saying as a household. Okay, so if, if I have a demandable deposit and suddenly rates hike, probably those are the ones that theoretically I would react to. But I'm not even sure it's only theoretically. I think that that's what DSS and some other people are pointing at. They're saying when, the, when households react, they react more on the overnight deposits. You also show that there's this decrease on overnight, I agree, so they're not so sticky, I think, okay? so. You know, probably this, and this is why I'm saying there's more than one paper out of here, 
probably this has effects for, you know, the stress test, the LCR ratios, all that assumptions are not only about this paper, are gonna have much more impact, okay? And, you know, <laughs> I would really appreciate if someone could just tell me, because I've, I've been thinking about this nearly as much as about your paper on the last day, so if someone could come to me or, and explain to me, I, I would really, really thank you, because I'm, I'm just stuck there a little bit. Anyway, it's a very nice paper, easy to remember, important for CHAM, and my only thing is, could we learn a little bit more of what's the underlying of, of this? I'm sure we can, so I'm just looking forward to learning more about your paper. Many thanks for any of you that can explain to me why are we having these sticky deposits overnight, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Lara, do you want to react to the discussion? So thanks a lot for the interesting discussion. Um, so first, I will try to reply in reverse order. So on this contractual and, and the fact that banks can behaviorally assume so many things about the stickiness of their deposits. So what, what uh, banks often do is that they have models to estimate the um, duration of these overnight deposits based on historical uh, customer <laughs> behavior. And these models are often calibrated based on the previous 10 years. And if you look at the start of, like now still, there was the majority of this period was low interest rates and deposits were very sticky. So that's why it happens. I'm not saying it's correct. It leads to an underestimation of, of interest rate risk. But I mean, that's, what, that's how, it, how it happens. And uh, related to your comment whether looking at the contractual uh, assumptions would matter, I think yes a lot because not only would the duration of assets be longer, because if you don't, if banks don't model loan prepayments, the duration of the loans would be longer, and the duration of the liabilities would be a lot shorter. So it would indeed give a, a different picture, and it would support this intuition that banks um, should have a, a, a positive duration gap and not a negative one. But since we use behavioral data, but also in the paper we use some we try to give some different intuitions why some of our banks, well, a quarter of our sample more or less, has a negative duration gap, such as the fact that there was TLT role, which also increased the, dura like the duration of the liability sites. Uh, and also these are often banks with a lot of floating rate loans, which decreases the duration of the asset site. Um, so these are things. And then um, definitely I agree that we can look a bit more at breakdowns. Uh, we have granular information so we could yeah we should exploit that definitely and also yeah try to also find more empirical support for the channels we propose like why why is this happening um, yeah so also an idea of like looking at uh, the derivatives or the yeah the hedging part separately would be yeah, something we will we will think about so thanks a lot for all the suggestions if there are some questions from the floor we can take them now Hey, great paper. Frederick Toscani from the IMF. I was wondering, very simple question, if you were to aggregate the heterogeneity a little bit, for example, on the bank side by geography, let's say, and on the firm side by sector or so, is there anything that stands out? We didn't really do this exercise yet, so um, yeah, it would be interesting to see also where, for example, banks with the high duration gap are more situated, which type of countries. But of course, this is related to having a lot of fixed rate loans, for example. In some countries, this is more pronounced than in others. But to give you now an answer to that, no, I, I can't. <laughs> there was another question there. Hello. Um, is this on? Yeah. Um, Tomas Carrera de Sousa from the Dutch Central Bank. Um, thanks for the paper, very interesting one. I have also a simple question about your, your measure of the duration gap. Um, so it's, it relates to, to David's comment on this assumption of, of, of longer duration of, of overnight deposits. I was wondering if this, um, yeah, if this changed throughout the, the time uh, of your sample and if this enters your, the variable you use in your empirical approach, because in fact uh, overnight deposits prove to be less sticky than they were assumed to be. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So the data is, is time varying. So um, 
we can take account of variations in, into these assumptions. What we see, however, is that this is very slow moving. So if you look at the quarter right before the tightening, <laughs> banks were still modeling the, the duration of their liabilities, these overnight deposits, based on the low interest rate uh, period. Um, and um, yeah, so even, even in the adjustments since the tightening, there, there, we see that some banks are adjusting, but other banks are not adjusting at all. So, um, but we have this information, yes. Yeah, Simone Manganelli, ECB. There is uh, a colleague of ours, Peter Hoffman, who has a paper on uh, using uh, Emir data to check uh, whether banks use uh, interest rate derivatives. And they find that uh, on average, the whole banking sector is hedged but there is a lot of uh, cross-section heterogeneity. So it would be interesting to see how your results change once you control for the exposure net of this uh, derivative. Right, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the suggestion. Yeah. There was another question over there. Um, hi, yeah, thanks for the great paper. It's actually a follow-up on one of the leads point about linking this increasing duration to uh, the low rate environment. Because from the graph you showed, um, it looked like duration is actually falling in the first part of your sample, but that's already during low fall on. Um, and then it's only increasing afterwards. So do you have any idea what, what changed to, um, yeah, to make that change in the trend? So you mean why there's the spike in the... So it looked like it was first falling and then later it's spiking and, and I wonder why. Yeah, no, I mean, it's also the COVID period is, is shown in this chart, so this might have an have an effect on it although like the, the the drop is a lot smaller than the steep increase we saw since the tightening so if you would take a line in the in the period before the tightening it's relatively stable the deviations are not that much but maybe the covid period could have could explain part of the of the drop okay so I see no other question, and uh, then we are ready to take uh, a coffee break, and we resume at uh, five past five. Thank you to all of you.